All right. Hopefully everybody had a nice break and got some chatting done and got a snack. All right. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, the, our next session, clinical trials, DM research, what you need to know about clinical trials. Um, this session is going to run for about 45 minutes. Uh, it'll begin with a presentation and then end with uh, question and answer time. So please save your questions until the end of the session and we'll, um, we'll come around with a microphone. Make sure that you wait until we have the microphone to you before you speak because the session is being recorded and the only way your, your question is actually recorded is if you're speaking into the microphone. So we will run them around to you. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce again, Dr. Erica Green. Dr. Green is a neurologist specializing in neuromuscular diseases. She's the director of the Neuromuscular Clinic at Houston Methodist. Welcome back, Dr. Green. All right, so I'm going to talk about clinical trials and what it means to be clinical trial ready. And I think a lot of us are familiar with the term clinical trial or clinical study, uh, FDA approval, but I, I think many in medicine aren't as familiar with the process and what those terms mean and, and how that impacts you as a patient. A lot of times patients will say, is there anything now available? And We'll talk about a clinical trial. We're excited about a new study, and they're like, well, when is it going to be approved? You know, how long will it take? So I hope that this talk sort of gives you some understanding. Um, so what is a clinical trial? It's basically a research study in which volunteers, uh, whether they're patients or volunteers with the disease or healthy volunteers without a disease, they allow themselves or they consent to be tested or observed. And the whole gist is there's a question. Will this help? What is the cause? And so they're observed or tested to answer that question. Will a drug work? Okay. You sharing it? No problem. All righty. And so what are some of the questions, as I've mentioned? Is a drug effective? Does it slow down the disease? Does it help symptoms? Does it improve survival? Is it safe? These are the questions that are asked when we talk about a clinical trial or study. And who will benefit? Is it for all patients with this particular condition? Is it a certain age, gender, um, for what aspect of the disease? There we go. All right. Um, the other thing that's important is it may be effective, but also we have to sort of assess, does the benefit outweigh the risks? So these are other considerations that come out of a clinical trial. Um, when they talk about safety, there may be risks associated with that drug. Every drug has a potential side effect profile. But is the benefit so overwhelming that the risks are acceptable? Okay. Also, later on when they're looking at a drug or a device, they also ask the question, what's the cost? So right now we have this expansion of drugs for which we've never had before that are treating advanced diseases like cancer, genetic diseases, and we're so excited about that, but these are coming with great costs, six figures per year. And so how does that impact the ability of a patient to access these new drugs? All of these things have to be considered because that means that even if we have a new drug, can all the patients afford that new drug? So what is clinical trial readiness? First of all, you have to know about the disease. It's not enough to study the disease and test a drug. You have to know how does the disease affect a patient or a population. What's the mechanism or the pathways? So if a disease is caused by factor A, how does factor A result in symptoms Z? What's the process between the cause of the disease and how the disease is manifested in a patient? How long does it take? What type of uh, symptoms? What tissues? Okay. 
Um, and then what are the tests that actually measure that disease? So a lot of times, especially in myotonic dystrophy, we have a natural history study um, where many of you may have heard, maybe participating, we're doing it at our site, where we're collecting data, clinical data. Some patients have consented to have biopsies of their muscle so that we can say as the patient progresses or changes or doesn't change, what are the things that correlate? How do patients perform or respond, or how does their disease affect them uh, based on their genetic mutation, based on their family history? And the reason why that's so important is if you can get an understanding of how the disease progresses or affects populations and how you measure that, then when you develop a drug that you can test, you can actually measure how it changes that course. And so um, to be clinical trial ready requires that as well as drug development, as well as research on animals and cells to understand the disease. So it involves many systems and many different people, peoples, including universities, drug companies, hospitals, the doctors, the researchers, the staff. To be clinical trial ready requires years, if not decades, of preparation, okay? And it all has to come together. So I would say for myotonic dystrophy, and, and, and Dr. Cooper can, can uh, agree or, or sort of add to that, is that much of the work that's been done and amazing work has been at the bench prior to this. And that's important. You have to understand what I mean by the bench is in the laboratory with animals. You have to understand the mechanism of disease in order to develop drugs. But now we're doing this uh, sort of natural history study so that we can now use these drugs and understand how it's impacting. And so it all has to come together. And I think we're at that season now where we're seeing this flurry of clinical trials as well as this, as this natural history study. So there are phases of clinical trials, and this is a busy slide, but I thought it's colorful and we can kind of go through it. And if you look at your pipeline here, um, you'll list all of the current uh, drugs that are being studied or looked at. Um, the companies, um, what it's supposed to do under modality. But if you go to the fifth column, sixth, seventh, and eighth, you'll see preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three. These are the phases of clinical trials. And they have to go through phases because they have to answer questions along the way. So preclinical is a phase that is before patients. It's where researchers like Dr. Cooper and other researchers are in the lab looking at cells, looking at animal models like flies and mice, uh, depending on the disease, where they can actually try to study the disease in an animal or in cells to understand what's going on. Okay? Extremely important, absolutely necessary, because unless you understand it at that level, it's hard to develop a drug to be directed at that particular cell or level of disease, okay? And this can take several years and decades, and it's ongoing. It never stops. It never stops. Phase one is where they look at safety. Uh, a phase one study can look at a whole host of different drugs where they screen hundreds of drugs, and they may look at the effect of these drugs on cells or on animals. And then out of 100 different drugs, they'll pick a drug, and then they'll either test it in healthy volunteers, very common, to say, okay, what dose is safe? If we just give this drug to healthy volunteers, does it make them very sick? Do they tolerate it? And at what dose? How does it interact with the body? Then once they answer that question and they say, this drug is safe at this range of doses, let's go to phase two. And phase two is where they look at, okay, now we've picked our range of doses. What, what dose is best and is it safe? And sometimes in phase two studies, they'll look at benefit. Is there a signal that it's actually helping? Okay, and they'll divide it between 2A, 2B. You'll see these letters. 2B is when they're beginning to look at benefits. So you have a greater number of patients this is in patients, and they're really deciding, okay, let's focus in on safety, the dosing, long-term, and then let's look at a little bit of benefit. But often, this is not enough to send to the FDA. 
The caveat is that many diseases are considered rare and there's no cure. So because of the Orphan Disease Act, which was approved a couple of almost two decades ago under, um, actually before Obama, now the FDA is looking at phase two trials because certain diseases are just too severe and we have nothing for them, okay? Phase three is once they've identified the drug, they have a dose, it's safe, and there's a signal that suggests that this can benefit the population, they do the gold standard of clinical trials, which is a phase three study. And this is in a much larger group of patients, and this is where they're looking primarily for benefit. Does it actually change, improve the outcome of patients? Um, and they're always monitoring safety. Let's say that that drug is studied in a phase three, it's proven beneficial, then it's submitted to the FDA, okay, which is a federal organization which looks at the data and decides this is both effective and safe and should be approved. Then the last phase is phase four, which is where data is still collected, often by the company or the researchers um, your registries often not, you know, may collect data as well to see, okay, now that it's available for all patients, how does it really act? Is it, are we still seeing that benefit? Are there other side effects or issues that we didn't pick up in the study? How is it performing in the real world? And often drugs continue to keep their approval. Sometimes um, they may change doses. And rarely, but necessarily, they have to be taken off the market because the risk is too great or it doesn't work. And so this is another diagram to really show sort of the funnel effect. And often patients will ask me, why does it take so long? Why does it take so long? It takes so long because the process to study the disease to identify where do we target, and then to identify an agent or drug to target that is both beneficial and safe takes time and a lot of money and a lot of investment and a lot of people. And so this funnel sort of shows that from agents 10,000 compounds down to 250, down to a few, down to one drug, and all of those necessary requirements that I've just talked about have to be considered and taken into, uh, in, into this sort of formula of time. And so I like diagrams. I'm repeating myself, but I think if you can get it from this, I just wanted to sort of show to you from phase one to phase three, the average length increases, the number of patients that have to be study, studied increases. Safety is the constant. It has to be safe. It has to be safe. And the purpose. How does the body process it? Is it working? And how well is it working? So, Again, I sort of talked about this. Sometimes you'll see letters. I think we often see letters after a phase trial designation, A and B is most common, and it's most commonly at phase two. This is where they're looking at specific doses, and the primary goal is to make sure it's safe make, and to assess the side effects, but a secondary goal may be looking at efficacy, and that's a phase 2B. And then I've talked about phase four, how does it work in the real world? And how does it work with different populations? Often in a clinical trial, for those who've participated, there are these criteria. And, and uh, is a patient eligible? Do they meet all the requirements? What are the things that might exclude a patient from participating in a trial? And I'm gonna have a slide regarding that, but the reason why they have those type of criteria is they're trying to select a certain population. If a population of patients has early, early disease, it may be too mild or too early to see an effect. If a patient has advanced disease, it may be too advanced to measure an effect. 
So often inclusion criteria or the criteria that excludes a patient from participating is to select a population that, where they can increase the chance of seeing an effect, okay? But once a drug is approved in phase four, they're seeing its effect on all of those patients. And so that's why after a drug is, is approved, it's so important to look at how it works in the real world because many of the patients in the real world weren't able to participate in the clinical trial. So I tell patients often when they're upset, when they're not able to participate in the clinical study, I say, if it's a beneficial treatment, you will receive the benefit eventually. And that's why it's so important to remain connected to healthcare so that you're healthy enough to get the treatment once it's approved. So. All righty. Um, so there are other types of clinical studies and clinical trials. Um, so when we talk about a clinical trial, it means that there is an intervention, whether it's a drug or whether it's a device that is given to a patient and then they measure how it affects their disease. Does it improve a symptom? Does it improve the progression? Does it improve survival? When we talk about observational studies, which is the natural history study, we're not intervening. We're not giving a drug. We're not giving a device. We're observing a population over time, collecting data to understand the disease, okay? Sometimes we're using observational studies to see how the environment affects a population. So I think it's important to delineate or to know the difference between a clinical trial and a clinical study. A study doesn't necessarily mean there's a drug involved. So this is a busy slide. You can take a picture. This is also recorded. Um, but there are many different types of clinical trials or clinical studies. Uh, one type of trial is, to, is for diagnosis. It's testing uh, or evaluating the ability of a test to diagnose. It could be a type of genetic test that's being studied. How accurate is it you know, in detecting the disease and not detecting something else? There might be a study, as I mentioned, natural history studies. It might be a prevention trial. If we do A, do we pre prevent B? If we educate a population, does the risk of diabetes go down on health and exercise, right? Um, it could be a quality of life. If we do A and B, does quality of life? And often in most clinical studies, quality of life is measured. In fact, the FDA wants quality of life to be measured because we can give a drug and um, this measure can go down, but does it make your day-to-day -day living better? So the FDA has actually prioritized quality of life because that is equally, if not more important, because that's what the patient lives every day. Um, screening trials is to screen. Uh, are we picking up the disease? And again, treatment trials, which is where you have a drug or a device. Um, so other things to know about. Anyone ever heard of the placebo, being randomized to a placebo? And so what I've heard is, you know, I want to participate, but I don't want to be random. I don't want to be placed on the placebo end. I want the drug. And of course, that makes sense because you're, you want to get the benefit of this study drug. Obviously, this may work. So I want to be uh, placed on the, the group that gets the drug. The reason why it's important to have a placebo, and we typically use a placebo for phase two and phase three. And let me define what a placebo is. A placebo is a substance or an agent or something that looks and smells very much like the drug that's being tested, uh, but it's not. It could be a sugar pill. It has no effect on your body or nothing significant. And basically a patient without knowing and often the investigator without knowing is randomly assigned to either get the drug or the placebo. Because we have to know if the drug really works, we have to see a difference between groups of patients receiving the drug versus groups of patients who think they're receiving the drug and don't know. Because there is something called the placebo effect. 
which means that if you think you're getting a drug, your body will rise to the occasion at least for a few weeks or days and act like it's getting better. That's the power of the mind. And we see that in 33% across trials. Just by being in a clinical trial, patients seem to do better. So we have to get rid of that background noise to say, okay, is the drug really doing it? So you need a control group to prove that it's truly the drug that's making the benefit. So I'm just going to say for patients who don't want to participate because they don't want to be assigned to a placebo, it's important to have the placebo because we have to prove that whatever your insurance or you are going to pay for works for you and that it's not a placebo response. I mentioned randomization. So in the phase three study, you often have a treatment group that gets the drug and you have that placebo group. But I don't want to have to decide you get the drug, you don't get the drug, you get the drug because I may make that decision because I know you. I may make that decision because mm, you look like you'll be a better patient. I don't want that. Even if I intentionally try to do it randomly, I can't trust subjectively what I may do without thinking, right? So there are protocols, there are algorithms, computer programs that can just randomly, any, meeny, miny, mo, assign patients who are part of a trial to the treatment group and to the placebo group. And what that does is it sort of tries to remove some of the subjectivity of picking and choosing. And if you have a large enough group of patients, then the patients in the treatment group and the patients in the placebo group should be fairly comparable, should be similar, similar ages, similar rates of disease, similar background, because you want a group that's comparable, that's the same. So single and double blind means that when you're randomized to a group, I don't know if you're getting the drug or not as the investigator. Even I don't know, that's double blinded. You don't know and I don't know. So a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial is the gold standard. Single-blinded is when only you don't know, but the gold standard is when I don't know either. So when I see you in my study, I'm not thinking, ah, drug, and it doesn't change how I measure what's going on. What, what slide was I on? Was I on the right slide? Yeah, there we go. Wonderful. And so who's on the clinical trials team? So you have the, not private investigator, okay. You have the principal investigator, um, not too private, very public. Um, you have a research coordinator and you have an evaluator. Now, there are many more people on the team, many more people necessary, but those are the primary people that you as a patient will come into contact with. So if I'm a PI or the primary investigator of the site, then I will be the primary one talking to you about the study, why we're doing the study, and we'll get your consent after being informed. Do you want to participate? This is how long it will take. This is what it will require. The Principal investigator is the one responsible for how that study is, is, is carried out to make sure that the patient is okay. The research coordinator is someone who's trained with all the documents, uh, getting everything together, scheduling, helping the investigator put the study together and to report it appropriately. And the evaluator can be a clinician, uh, can be a therapist. Um, someone who evaluates, sort of measures what's going on. So these are the three persons that you as a patient involved in a trial will come into contact with most often. So what to expect if you want to or choose to participate in the clinical trial? I've sort of mentioned some of this already, but first you have to be screened. Do you meet the criteria to be included in the study? Um, do you have the disease? Are you in the right age range? Um, do you have any other clinical factors that would exclude you? Do you have significant heart disease where you can't safely make it to the study? Do you have a history? And these are, I'm not, I'm just speaking general things, but these are things that may sort of cloud the data. 
if you're sick with something else and you're not breathing very well from something else, that could cloud how we measure your breathing due to myotonic dystrophy. Okay. So we'll screen, we'll look at charts. We may bring you in for testing to say, okay, do you meet criteria to be involved? And then if you meet, you become eligible and then we consent you. So someone will sit down with you, maybe mail you a, an informed consent and then come and sit down with you and go over it, answer all of your questions so that you are fully informed. You know what's going on. You know what to expect and you can withdraw from that study at any point in time. You can say, I no longer want to do this study and I want my data removed. You can do that too. It's all about the patient. There are no guinea pigs in that sense in, in studies. And that's why it takes so long because it's about keeping you safe and protecting your decision-making ability about your care. And then there are a number of study visits and evaluations. And before you enter into a trial, it's important to know, can you come as often as is required? Can you do what they're asking you to do? Again, just to go over very quickly, this is the most common eligibility criteria. And inclusion criteria are those things that would allow a patient to enter into the study. Are they the right age? Do they have the diagnosis? Do they live within 50 miles of the site? Are they able to come? Can they do the testing? For the um, natural history study, this is all there is. Very easy. So if anyone has not participated, we're a site, come talk to us. Okay. Uh, exclusion criteria, unable to give consent, other significant diseases, participating in another study. But depending on the study, that may be different for every study, okay? And so this is pre-screening. We do chart reviews. Uh, we look at referrals. We contact the patient. Someone may call you, may email you with the informed consent. And then often when you come to clinic, the research coordinator will talk to you. Um, and so informed consent, as I mentioned, is to ensure that you completely understand the reason why they're doing the study, the risks involved, the requirement for medical procedures, but also to uh, allow you to ask questions and to ensure that no matter what, if something happens, you're going to get care. Your care will not be less than. In fact, I'll tell you something. I feel that most patients who participate in clinical trials often will say, even if I can't benefit, I, I feel good that I can contribute. Number two, often you're getting much more attention than you would just going to a standard appointment. You're being seen more frequently, you're being assessed more frequently, and often when we get feedback from patients, they feel like the care and the attention was better. So I think it is a benefit overall. Um, going back to informed consent, the reason why we go through this process is you have, you're independent. Your autonomy, your ability to not be under someone else's direction, to be manipulated uh, because of education or background or just experience, it doesn't matter who the patient is, what they know, we have to make sure that you can independently assess your desire to participate. So that means translation, you know, translators. That means if you're vulnerable, if there is mental issues or learning disabilities, that person may not be able to make that decision. And so that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, it empowers you and it builds trust. You have to be able to trust the doctors and the team. It promotes clear communication. It decreases the risk of uh, the, the, it reduces the, the risk associated with uh, the treatment and participating in the trial because the communication is good. Um, and it's based on, you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath that physicians and clinical care providers uh, take, which is ultimately our goal is to do no harm. So I guess my message for you is that clinical trials and research take time because it takes time to understand the disease and to determine what treatment is best. But the priority is patient safety. The priority is to say, can we give you something that helps you to be better, but keep you safe? And I just won't go over this. This is for you to review on your own, but these are the basic elements of informed consent, why we're doing it, the duration of the study, the frequency of study uh, visits, 
what they're going to do when you come to your visit, what they hope to find, the risks, um, alternatives, the confidentiality. No one will know you're participating. There are um, things that are put into place to protect your identity, even in the electronic medical record that you're participating in this trial. Some study participants, depending on the trial, are compensated um, for participating in a trial, uh, not necessarily for injury, but for a compensation for travel, compensation for participating, and, and that's also available. Who to contact in case there are questions or uh, emergencies, and the right to withdraw or to refuse. And so this is just a list of all the assessments. There's going to be a physical exam, pulmonary function studies, the middle picture, uh, some blood tests uh, are often very common, and muscle grip testing. Those are the classic ones, especially for myotonic dystrophy. These are pretty typical. Uh, we've already talked about being blinded uh, and randomization. And this is just really to talk about the timeline and how often it takes. Let's say this is a 12-week trial. Most trials, depending on the phase, can be from 12 weeks to a year. Some are longer. But you see that it begins with screening. And then based on screening, if the patient is able to be eligible, is randomized, that's day zero. And then this is an example of the number of visits. So in this trial, this person is seen every four weeks, three visits after randomization, so a total of five visits. And after randomization, you can see that they're either randomized to the drug or to the placebo. And safety monitoring, these are uh, terms you may see. There are adverse events, which we call AEs, serious adverse events called SAEs, uh, and then we have those that are uh, quite severe called SUSARs, which can affect clinical outcomes. And so we have to report everything that happens. If you get a toothache, it has to be reported. And we have to determine, is it related to the drug? Is it related to disease or just an incidental happening? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? And was it enough to bring you to the emergency room or to be admitted? And so uh, this is behind the scenes. I talked about the three individuals that patients often come into contact with, but there's a whole host of people and organizations and systems involved. There's a board or a committee of typically clinical investigators, clinicians, researchers who look at the data throughout the trial to make sure that it's still safe. And if it's not safe, they can stop the trial. They can hold the trial. Let's say, so there are mechanisms to make sure that patients remain safe. Um, and so there's a charter, members, and they look at the data on an interim basis. And so I'm part of a data safety, data safety monitoring board, and we meet to make sure that we can still give the go-ahead to proceed with the trial. And there's clinical history that justifies that, where patients were not safe and the trial continued. So these are the benefits. I'm almost done. First of all, there's a sense that you're contributing to research and to advances uh, in the knowledge and the treatment of the disease. It actually brings awareness to the disease. Uh, not only from the community and from clinicians, but just from the general population, because often there's advertisements. Um, maybe there's potential exposure to a beneficial agent. Often, the clinical trial, once you're done, they'll allow a patient to continue on the medicine until it's ready for FDA submission and or approval. Um, you're free to stop without any consequences. Uh, and standard of care, what you would normally get as a patient, continues. It doesn't go away. There are potential side effects with everything, but again, I hope I've talked about how much monitoring goes into making sure that we're looking for risk factors, being able to intervene as soon as possible. And I think it's important to understand as a patient who participates is that you might participate in a trial where there's no benefit at the end. You might have participated in a trial where it didn't show benefit, but I still think it's important because we actually learn from clinical studies that even, even don't work. It actually takes us back to the drawing board. And sometimes we can actually go back into the data and maybe it didn't work for all of the patients, but it worked for a subset of patients. 
So don't be discouraged from participating because there's a risk that it's not a waste of time is what I'm telling you. It's not a waste of time. It does require time and effort and randomization and possibly being on a placebo. Um, so where do I find out about clinical current trials? So this is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this, I just took a screenshot. Uh, you can't see it, but I put in myotonic dystrophy, and this was page one of many pages, <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so you can search based on the disease, and you can see what's available throughout. Uh, and so they also have contact information, how many sites are participating, if it's enrolling, if it's closed, if it's about to enroll. And of course, I would be remiss without mentioning the resource of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. Um, this is um, where you can go and look at a research map of DM clinical trials and studies. Again, this is on the website. And so uh, I'll end there uh, with a quote. We love their passion for the cause, strong community, and amazing staff, which I think uh, is so true about MDF and its re resources. So I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you very much. Yes. Um, because I like to think way far past where we actually are, um, I have a child with myotonic dystrophy, a congenital. So a lot of these trials are not for children. Specifically, he's a baby. Um, at what point, if a drug is approved, does a compassionate use component come into play? Because for him, I mean, there are there's things that are very close, but he's not going to meet their age requirement. But I'm smart. I can, you know, I feel like I have the, the mindset where I should be able to determine if he could get it. When does that ever play a part, compassionate use? So there, there are a couple of things to consider, and thank you for your question. So number one, often for those diseases which are considered rare or without any treatment, um, those considerations are there. Often the drug company uh, and the FDA will approve that, uh, especially if they're considering the data. So it's not fully approved, but there's enough signal there where while they're processing and considering the data, they will allow compassionate use. Okay. Um, I will say that my experience, and I'll let the other clinicians and investigators speak to that, I find that that access to compassionate use varies. Not all patients who say, well, I want to be, often it's, it's limited to those who are in the trial. Uh, but that depends on the drug and depends on the disease. So I, I find that it's not as easy to navigate that. And if it was studied in an adult population, it wouldn't be compassionate use for someone outside of that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just to follow up on that question, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, what is the process for uh, taking a drug that's been through this process for normal adult populations and, and uh, applying it to children? Is it, does it just restart at the beginning with the different uh, constraints on the study? So the F I mean, yes, we have to, we historically, and, the, and the, the standard is it has to be studied in pediatric populations. It has to be. You can't take that data from adults and apply it to children because although they're still humans, the developmental process, the ability to handle medications is different. And so you have to study it separately in the pediatric population. And often, depending on the disease, it happens soon after the adult population or along with an adult study. Sometimes it's first in the pediatric patients based on the disease, and then they study in the adult. So an example with that would be um, some of another muscular dystrophy called Duchenne. It affects boys, and there's a milder form that can affect older boys and men, but most of the studies are in the boys. And so patients who have the milder form are upset because they're waiting for it. So it can go in either direction. Did that answer your question, sir? Okay. Was it understandable before? Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes, sir. Okay, yeah, I don't like it either. It's not my answer. It's it's a it's an answer, an answer, but it's not mine. Yeah, we were in a study in 2015 in uh, University of Utah, and we never got the results. And then our doctor moved back east, and so we kind of lost track of the study. And what's our next progression? Can we continue on the next study? So um, I'm not sure what that study was. I, I think it's it's worth. Um, going back to your, your data, your, your materials, and getting the name. And even if you can't find that clinician, the MDF is a resource. Your current clinician can look it up for sure and tell you the outcome of the study. I think it, you deserve that. Um, I'm going to say yes, depending on um, you or your family member as a patient, if they meet the criteria, they should be able to participate in another study. Typically, between studies, there's a washout period uh, where if you're ex potentially exposed to a drug, you have to have been beyond that clinical study by maybe a month or two months, three. Depending on what they're studying, there has to be a washout. And it sounds like since it was 2015, there's been enough of a washout. So I'm going to say likely if they meet the criteria, they can participate in another study. I just wanted to add that the, the study we were in was with Dr. Nick Johnson and it was um, the clinical trial beginning phase one for the children to um, be able to take the, um, one of the meds that they were developing. And so we participated in um, phase one and phase, part of phase two, I think, and then Dr. Johnson moved from Utah to, to Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Was, uh, well, then I, I, I'm going to say that he's still uh, able to be contacted. Uh, he's a leader in terms of clinical trials and clinical research. Uh, he's really uh, sort of the face. So he's very much involved and can be accessed uh, either directly where he is at Virginia Commonwealth or through the MDF. Yes, sir. Could you clarify the 50-mile limit to participating? Is that just... General clinic, or is that East? so that those criteria that I mentioned were specific to our natural history study as an example? Um, it's not standard. It, it's not like what you would see for all studies. That's an example that I use for our natural history study because they took into consideration the ability of patients to come to visits, um, and so that's 50 mile radius. Um, I think we can ex we can exclude that, uh, especially if the sponsor says so, if the patient can come easily. But that's for some patients, that's very difficult, so that was uh, a criteria. That doesn't mean that's going to be the criteria for every study or trial, though. That was just for that one. All right, this is our final question because um, the other group will be joining us in a minute, and then we're going to go right into our movement moments. But, you know, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I assume I made it clear, but that doesn't mean I did make it clear. So if there are any questions that I can answer afterwards, I'll make myself available. So I, I have a question about clinical trials and knowing which one you should enroll in, because one of the things I've heard from the presentation here is that if you're in one, you, you, that will exclude you from another. Um, and, you know, I, I, I see that we can get on the registry, but, you know, part of what I'm curious about is, is which one, how, how do you know which one you should, is it just first come, first serve, or should you, is there some um, basis uh, for figuring out which one you should enroll in, both for your own benefit, but also for the usefulness of the science produced? Sure. Um, I, my, my response to that is to first make sure that you have to make that decision based on your personal uh, understanding. In other words, um, you have to talk to the investigator or the researcher. You have to understand why they're studying what they're studying. And then you have to decide, can you participate? I think that's first and foremost. Can you participate? Can you um, go to the visits? Can you go through the procedures? 
and the length of the study. So that's priority. In terms of which drug is best, which trial is best, not a fair question <laughs> per se, but we get it from patients all the time. Uh, well, which one would you participate in, Dr. Green? And um, the whole point of studying is to answer that question. And so I, I think that requires you to, to, to discuss it with the investigator, your clinician, uh, the clinical researcher, um, to, to say, you know, what is the data that supports this? Um, that would be a question. How much information has gone into understanding this? That is this a company or a sponsor that you're familiar with? That's something. Do they have a track record of good research and good research methodology? That's important, too. Um, have they been doing DM for a while? That may be a consideration. But beyond that, it's whether or not you can participate in the study. Um, and I, I open it up to Dr. Cooper, Dr. Schroff, or any other person in the room who wants to add to that, but that's my response. Are there any known uh, risks? What are the side effects, you know, like of that drug, which, which they are, are there known side effects? Uh, are they, are they uh, um, severe or are they minor? So those, those are also, you know, just to add on to, to know if, okay, am I willing to take that risk or um, experience that adverse effect if I participate in this study. So those are some of the things to think about. Yeah. And you, she, yeah, thank you. Is also, is it a phase one, phase two, phase three? Is this just safety? Uh, is there a little benefit? Are you okay with that? Um, phase three, typically they have more information about safety. That's why they've gone to phase three. So knowing the phases is important too. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Green, so much for that wonderful presentation, and thank you for the great uh, questions to our session.